Good morning, and uh, can I welcome everybody to this, the first meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2022. The first item on our agenda today is to uh, take items, take a decision on whether to take items four and five in private. Um, my working assumption is that everybody agrees to do that, but if anybody disagrees, I wish uh, could they please indicate uh, by raising their hand. Um, I don't see any hands raised, so we agree to take items four and five uh, in private. The second item uh, on our agenda this morning uh, is to consider an Audit Scotland uh, report, the 2020 to 21 audit of Bordnagallic. And can I welcome this morning uh, our witnesses uh, to the meeting? Um, I'd like to introduce Stephen Boyle, Auditor General uh, for Scotland. Uh, Graeme Greenhill also joins us, who's a Senior Manager, Performance Audit and Best Value at Audit Scotland. And Pat Kenny, uh, who's a Director of Audit uh, at Deloitte, also joins us. Uh, so could I begin, uh, Auditor General, by inviting you to make an opening statement? Good morning, convener. Uh, good morning, members. Many thanks. I am presenting this report this morning on the 2020-21 audit of Borna Gaelic under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. The previous Auditor General reported a report on the Board's 2018-19 audit, and it highlighted a number of areas for improvement in its leadership and governance arrangements. My report on the 2020-21 audit has found that the Board has responded well to previous concerns. It has changed the structure of its leadership team and introduced additional management capacity. A workforce plan is also now in place, which links to its corporate plan and it identifies its future workforce requirements. The number of non-executive board members on the Board have reduced but skills gaps that were previously identified have now been addressed with the recruitment of two new board members with relevant financial experience. Roles and responsibilities of the senior management team, its committees, the board and sponsor teams are now clearer following additional training. The board's framework document with the Scottish Government has also been updated. Convener openness and transparency have significantly improved. All committees and board meetings are now held in public, with meetings advertised in advance on social media. There is also regular stakeholder engagement activities with the other Gaelic organisations. The board of today is an improved organisation to the one subject to the 2018-19. The pace of improvement in addressing previous concerns is welcome. Given the long-term challenges required, it is likely that the full benefits of the improvements we are reporting will emerge further over time. It therefore remains important for the Board to monitor whether the changes are delivering long-term benefits with measurable impact and make appropriate adjustments where necessary. Convener, as ever, Pat, Graham and myself will do our best to answer the Committee's questions this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that um, opening statement. I've got a couple of questions before I invite um, other members of the committee. And I just do think it is worth recapping uh, where things were back in 2018-19. Uh, I mean, the conclusions of that report spoke about ineffective leadership, a lack of clarity over roles and responsibilities, poor relationships and organisational culture, and uh, inadequate workforce planning, uh, to such an extent that the auditor um, in giving evidence to the predecessor committee of this one, said, and I quote, in terms of the findings and recommendations, I cannot think of another report that has raised such serious issues during my time in this role. So uh, a pretty uh, damning indictment of the way things were. So when we turn to uh, the report that's just been published, uh, there appears to have been uh, quite a considerable turnaround. So my first question, Auditor General, is, what has the catalyst been that's made such a transformative difference to the organisation? So, so the first thing I would just agree with you, Convener, actually, and recognise that the report that the predecessor committee, committee considered 2018-19 audit was incredibly significant and challenging and critical of a wide set of arrangements um, in the organisation. 
Um, we have seen, and, and Pat will no doubt give his views over the course of this morning on the various factors um, behind that. But I think what, in terms of the catalyst, there is no doubt that public scrutiny in and of itself and the work of the Parliament and its committees and Section 22 reports can be catalysts for improvements in performance. And I think, as we have said in some of our comments, that is really welcome that that has been the reaction to previous Section 22 reports, and we are pleased to see some of the progress that we are seeing. And this is not just about a number of small or minor changes. And we look at the, the scale of the, the, um, the recommendations, so over 40 recommendations translated into 70 plus actions that were taken forward. Considerable effort has been made by the board using um, the, the audit findings, working in partnership with the government and with its stakeholders, have all led to what we would say is an organisation that is now performing as it ought to. So a, a range of factors, and no doubt the work of the hard work of the board and its uh, and its board of governance, have all been behind this. But I would say one little caution, convener, if I may, actually, is that um, the longer term benefits of this impact over the short term is where it really now matters. That the board is functioning well, is delivering for the Gaelic speaking community. What it's done is got itself back to a position that perhaps it ought to have been in the first place. And it now matters that it can take forward this momentum, delivering upon all what it's there to do uh, for the Gaelic speaking community in the country. Thank you. And um, uh, if Graham or Pat want to come in at any point, um, if they put an R in the chat box, or I'm sure the Auditor General will uh, will bring them in. I mean, it's often the case, isn't it? It's not just making the change; it's keeping the change going in an organisation that's uh, that's critical. And one of the things which um, uh, I note from the report is that the um, the board appointed an external uh, change management expert in 2021 to 22 to, um, as it says in the report, to embed its developing approach to continuous improvement and maintain the pace of change, which really goes uh, to that point. So uh, m my next question uh, is: Is that appointment a permanent one? Uh, that um, external um, continuous improvement expert, is that going to be a permanent part uh, of the organisation uh, going forward? And um, uh, if it is, what should they be prioritising in the months and uh, years ahead? I'm happy to start, and I'll, I'll invite Pat to come in um, to supplement my response. So it's our understanding that it's not a permanent uh, appointment to, uh, to Board of Gaelic. And I think and that's, I suppose we got to the point. That's not an unreasonable situation, um, but given the size of the organisation, notwithstanding the challenges that, that we previously reported, but it remains a, a relatively small organisation in terms of the number of people that it employs, um, and when it gets itself, as we anticipate uh, and expect, really to a stable, high-performing organisation, um, it can take a view as to the need for it to call on external support. And so I understand it is a um, it is a consultancy service that it is accessing, and um, that has supported the delivery of the recommendations that were identified from previous audits, and is beginning to move forward with what that now means. Term plans, as we talk about in parts of the report, for its corporate plan, its connections to its workforce, financial plans. So a consultancy nature of, of appointment convener. Uh, but I'll turn to Pat just to say a little bit more about what he's seen and his views on. And how well that arrangement is working. But yeah, uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, yes, we, we made the initial recommendation three years ago that the uh, that the board should consider the appointment of the external change management resource, because we felt it was very important in terms of delivering that continuous improvement that that that, that happened, and, and I think it has made a massive difference, um, particularly in in how the organisation. Um, engages with its stakeholders and how it manages the change process, um, and uh, it's introduced, introduced a very uh, uh, sound practice for um, ensuring the benefits of change initiatives are actually delivered within the organisation and the, and the benefits are realised. I mean, I, I would expect that the organisation is a consultancy resource; it is not a permanent resource. I would expect the organisation to keep that under review, and I know that they're, they're, they're doing that. 
And I, I think it's very important they, they, they do that going forward in terms of ensuring that they, they, they continue that journey in terms of being as, as close to their customers as they possibly can be. And I, I would see that as the key imperative um, for the organisation in, in the next few years. Um, thank you. I mean, there is mention in the report, I think, of a an improvement plan steering group. Um, is is the um, is the expectation that that will uh, continue for some time, or is that a time limited uh, part of the organisation's work as well? I don't know whether Pat, you want to come back in that, and we can widen it out if other people have got yeah. comment or commentary on that. It's happy to do so, Chair. I mean, that group has transitioned to what's now called a continuous improvement um, a, 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 a steering group, and I think that's important uh, because that's again about the process of embedding that continuous improvement within the organisation. And I, I, and I would see that group um, um, continue in place for the, you know the medium term, definitely. And I think that transition to continuous improvement is very important in terms of that change journey. Thank you. And again, if anybody wants to uh, to come in, if you just put an R in the chat box. One of the things which uh, I just wanted to kind of round off this section of questions uh, with Pat, and I think I'll start with you, is just to again uh, clarify: is the continuous improvement plan that was plan that was produced? Is that in the public domain? Is that publicly available for um, uh, members of the community, with a, especially with an interest in the uh, the working of the board? Uh, is that accessible to people publicly? Yes, the, 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 certainly within the, uh, the, the the board's annual report, there's the strong visibility of the improvement plan um, in various. Um, um, Parts of the uh, the annual report, and there's very good um, monitoring about the, the, the improvement plan's objective and how they're doing. So I think visibility, transparency, and openness of the improvement plan is good, Chair. Yes. Yeah, because again, as previously identified, openness and transparency was a bit of, a, a bit of an issue back in 2018-19. So um, uh, that's a, a continuing uh, area of interest for us. Um, uh, the, the final question I've got is to go back to, and I think um, the Auditor General mentioned uh, that there were 72 actions uh, which came out of the recommendations, uh, and um, of those 72, 71 um, are, um, are, have been implemented. Um, uh, so uh, the Public Audit Committee being uh, the nature of the beast that it is, I want to ask about the, the 72nd uh, um, action which hasn't been uh, so far implemented, and I wonder whether somebody could uh, give us an explanation um, as to why there has been a hold up with that. Is that is it simply a matter of timing? Is it contingent on other issues? Uh, what is it? Just so we've got a better understanding of uh, of what the outstanding action is. I'm happy to start. Okay. If you want to start, yeah. Thanks, I'm happy to start. Actually, I'm, I'm sure Pat will want to come in as well. Um, the outstanding action, I think, is in respect of, if my memory is correct, its engagement with um, the Gallic community as, as forward plans. Not an insignificant action, but I think one that um, was within the time frame that was intended to be completed part of the plan, so not necessarily one that, that's overdue, bearing in mind that the COVID will have a, had a bearing in the, the ability of the, the board uh, and its stakeholders uh, to engage. And so, um, as ever with you know our audit work, it's something that you know, we'll continue to monitor. And Pat will do so during his audit of the 21-22 uh, year of the board, uh, and we'll continue to report publicly on progress. But I think I would recognise, Convener, you know, that 71 out of 72 is, is really remarkable progress, um, given, as you you, know, you said in your your, your scene setting notes, that there was a considerable job of work to be done. But of the one action that, that's remaining, uh, it is important, and it does matter that that's followed through on. The PAC can just confirm that, that my understanding is correct. Yeah, the, the one outstanding, outstanding action is in, in relation to the, and it's just a timing issue, Chair, as, as you say. Um, it's in relation to the multi-year funding agreements, which are obviously three or five-year based. 
and um, we recommended that there, there should be clear KPIs, a clear alignment to the corporate plan, so that we could really monitor the outcomes that these multi-year funding agreements were, were delivering. So, purely in relation to the timing of that, that will be action next in line with the next uh, negotiations on these multi-year funding arrangements. So, it's perfectly reasonable that that action is still outstanding. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. And um, uh, we do have further questions on engagement, which will come up um, <coughs> later on in this in this evidence session. But I want now to uh, to turn to um, Colin Beatty. Who's got some uh, uh, questions around board scrutiny? Colin. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Dr. General, looking at the 2018 19 report, as a result of that, the number of non executive board members was reduced from 11 to 7. Now, in the 2020 21 Section 22 report, it states that consideration of the capacity of board members is an ongoing issue for the board, given, and I quote, the workload associated with the position, unquote. Can you clarify what this workload involves, and does it derive from the fact that the number of non-executive board members was substantially reduced? Hey, good morning, Mr. Beattie. Happy, happy to start, on that, and I'm sure Pat will want to say a word about it, too. Um, you are right in your recollections that the 1819 report and evidence sessions highlighted concerns about the, the scrutiny that the Board was, was undertaking. Um, and particularly, we focused on, and as the Board has too, about did it have the right skills in place? And the skills are connected clearly to the capacity of the, the Board to discharge its scrutiny functions. What we have seen um, is improvements in scrutiny. Also, connections to the skills that it needed to discharge those functions well. So, it's brought in um, new board members with the relevant financial skills to discharge that gap in scrutiny that was reported previously. In doing so, it has reduced the number of board members. So, I think we would say that we are we are neutral on it about the relative number of board members that ought to be in place in a particular board. It ultimately is a matter for the public body in discussion with the Scottish Government and the relevant sponsor teams about how that is operating. Over the years, Mr Beattie, you will have seen um, that the, the number of board members on a particular board is not necessarily indicative of its success in, in discharging scrutiny arrangements. And it probably plays into, I think, the kind of final comment that I made in my opening statement is that it is perhaps too soon to draw um, absolutely definitive conclusions about governance and scrutiny into the longer term. We welcome the progress that has been made in terms of um, governance and scrutiny. We have seen actions taken in terms of self-assessment, external assessment of the Board's work and its committees. All of those are giving positive signals. But I, wouldn't, I would hesitate before drawing definitive conclusions that that means all will be well into the longer term. It is important that this is regularly checked and monitored, but it now has a platform with which to proceed with more effective governance than you saw in 2018-19. But you have flagged this fact in the latest report that uh, the capacity of board members is an ongoing issue for the board, and, as I said, due to the workload associated with the position. What is this workload? What is this overwhelming workload that they have got? Well, the workload of any board member will, of, of any public body will always be in respect of Considering papers, attending meetings, the appropriate contribution um, into board strategy, um, and finding the right balance and the right position for uh, board members relative to executives. So, as as you've seen, and the committee have seen both in this organisation and in others, sometimes if there is a lack of clarity in the boundaries of the executive relative to the non-executive, that can skew the the workload of um, of non-executive members. It matters that both the exec, the non-exec, the sponsor team are all clear on who is responsible for what. So, whilst there may be um, ongoing uh, capacity workload challenges, what we're not doing in this report is flagging that as a as a red flag to the committee. I think our overall impression is that having invested in additional skills and capacity, particularly those areas that were lacking in terms of finance skills, previous reports. 
they now have a stronger foundation with which to proceed. Clearly, yes, they still need to monitor the capacity issues, but we are not saying that that overrides the overall improvements that we are commenting upon. But they reduced from 11 to 7. Five of the current board members were there in 2018-19, so there has been no change to the skills base there. All that's happened is two people have been brought in with, it says here, relevant financial experience. So, how does that balance the skills across the piece with the other five? This is one component of it. So, certainly, bringing in new skills has made a big difference. And, and Pat can come in in a moment and, and say um, some of the detail and, and perhaps more about the background of, of those new members. Any new members with relevant skills changes the dynamic of a board, the opportunity to learn from one another, um, and we expect that that is part of the component that we are seeing here. The other factor we would say is that they have also changed some of the nature of their committees. They have evaluated committees. They have received training on their, their roles and abilities, and they are now operating with a revised framework document. All of these are building blocks in our assessment, Mr Beatty, of um, Opportunities for improved governance um, that we are seeing. So the the number of board members, the new skills, part of the story. But I think when we add in the the evaluation of how their governance has been operating in the board and the committee, with some external assessment of that, along with the new framework document, we all feel that these are the, it's not just one moving part. There are a range of combination of factors that have contributed to the improvement that we're seeing. If I may, I may like to bring Pat in just about you know. His own interaction with the board and how that has his assessment of the conclusions that he made. Pat, yeah, uh, thanks, Auditor General. Yes, I mean I think um, uh, a good example for me would be the the new chair that on the, uh, for the Audit and Assurance Committee with the financial background, um, a qualified accountant, um, has made a big difference in terms of overall governance, uh, financial stewardship within the organisation. And uh, I think that's been really impressive, um, and has made a big, big difference um, in terms of gov overall governance within the organisation. I think the overriding point I would make, um, just to back the Auditor General's comments up, is that the reduction from to eleven to seven was obviously a, a fairly significant material reduction. And I think the comment, the overriding comment in the report, is that it is important that the board keeps. The workload of the the board members under constant review, um, given that fairly material change. Um, as Stephen says, we're not raising any red flags at this moment in time, and it's something that I'll keep under constant review as in the audit going forward. You have emphasised the fact you're not raising a red flag in a way. You have though by putting it in the report that it is an issue for the board. But uh, can you confirm that? The capacity of the board is not a risk factor at this time. So I think that's um, we are not identifying in, in what on pack in well, Mr. Beatty, that with the overarching changes that have been made to clarification around roles and responsibilities for training, self assessment, and as we've mentioned, the revised framework document, that there is sufficient uh, steps in place for the board's governance to operate effectively. Um, our, our comment about the, the reduction in the board members and the associated workload, I think, is appropriate as a scene setter, and, and it would be appropriate for all public bodies that they are continually monitoring and reviewing it. But, but in doing so, as, as to, to continue the phraseology, we're not assessing that as a red flag in terms of the ability of Board of Galax governance to operate effectively. Put it more simply, do you consider the capacity of the board to be a risk to the board? So no, we're no, no, we're not saying that. We're not saying that there is a, a direct uh, capacity threat to the board in the way that um, I suppose if we, we think there's been a step change, if I can put it and trying to keep this simply for if I'll do my best to do so. With eleven board members, its governance was weaker with the seven board members that it now has. Seven, albeit with a smaller board, its governance is stronger and it has a stronger platform for effective good governance going forward. Okay, that's encouraging. Um, in the 2018-19 Section 22 report, 
Concerns were raised that the previous chair did not carry out annual performance appraisals of board members. Can you confirm that that is now happening? I'll I'll turn to Pat actually just to update the, the committee on that point. Yes, I, I can give you that assurance. And that, that is now happening. Good. And just one final question. The normal term of office for a non executive board member is four years, although length of appointments can be varied, you know, for continuity purposes. Do you know when the recruitment process for new members is likely to commence? I'm not sure I have that information, but you're right, it's four years, and also, uh, as you suggest, Mr. Beattie, there's the opportunity for, for reappointments of uh, existing board members to, for, for continuity issues, if, if, if that suits both the member uh, and the uh, public appointments arrangements. Um, again, I'll ask Pat if he has that information. If he doesn't, we can come back to the committee. Okay. No, I don't have that detail, Auditor General. Okay, so if you could come back to us with that information. And back to you, convener. Um, thanks, Colin. Um, I, I want to um, switch on to the issue of leadership, which again was um, identified as an issue uh, in the, the previous um, Section 22 report. And Craig Hoy has got a series of questions to put uh, around the leadership of the organisation. Craig. Thank you, uh, convener. And, and, uh, Good morning, uh, Stephen. Um, Border Gaelic is the principal public body for promoting uh, Gaelic development, and we note that the leadership team role of Head of Communications and Promotions, which was previously a vacant position, has now not been incorporated into the new leadership team structure. And given that is quite an important um, function, uh, uh, who is now uh, responsible um, for this work at, at, at a senior level, and are you comfortable with, with that, that decision? So ultimately, in terms of responsibility, the chief executive board is the accountable officer and responsible for the board's discharge of its functions, public reporting and, and, and reporting to Parliament. We set it at Exhibit One to the, um, the Section Twenty Two report, the revised structure. What we've reported on is a is a smaller executive team structure headed by the chief executive, director of Gaelic education, and director of language planning communities. Along with a head of finance and corporate services, you asked whether I, I was comfortable with it, and I would say ultimately it's for the organisation to determine its own structure and, and how best to, to discharge it, its responsibilities. So what we've seen is that the Board of Gaelic has reviewed its structure and in part has, has addressed the, the findings of previous audit reports. There was a, a lack of capacity at management level, a lack of cohesion, and invested in a both a, a changed top team, but also more capacity at the tier below of the organisation. So the responsibilities of of communication are ultimately of that of the chief executive. Um, and I think I'll just check with Pat again in terms of the director of language planning. Is my assumption as to where those direct responsibilities at executive team level uh, now sit? Um, as ever, Mr. Hoy, it would depend on um, the success of these arrangements going forward that the the board can effectively demonstrate that it is meeting the requirements of the Gaelic speaking community um, in its structure, keeps that under close and continuous review. Um, but as ever, Pat might want to come in just in terms of his own interaction with the executive team. Yes, I mean, I th the, 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 there's been a, a new appointment of a, a communication officer um, uh, in the next layer of management, which has made a big, big difference in terms of how the organisation communicates with both its staff and its stakeholders, and uh, we we noted a, a big improvement, for example, in terms of staff engagement. Um, it's 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 now uh, at eighty seven percent, which is significantly higher than it was, and I think that's actually above civil service average. And so that that's been a, a big improvement, and, and and also communication with stakeholders, um, external stakeholders, has also improved considerably. Use of social media has also improved a lot since the new communications officer has come in. So I think that there's been that focus as communication. A lot of that has been driven by that new appointment, and I think um, that that has made a, quite a big difference to date. That's that's reassuring. I just wanted to get some assurance that the organisation wasn't 
sort of looking in on itself and, and, and not engaging externally. But that sounds like um, we take some assurance from that. Um, the 2018-19 uh, Section 22 report highlighted the leadership issues um, and identified that that led to a lack of confidence and a culture of mistrust throughout the organisation. As we know from other recent inquiries, um, organisational culture doesn't change overnight. It needs um, hard work and, and a lot of effort. So, what, what work has the board undertaken, uh, Mr. Boyle, uh, to build back trust and to, to regain the confidence of its staff? Thanks, Mr. Boyle. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with your analysis, Ashley, and, and I'll, I'll say a few words. And Pat will um, may want to supplement with his own um, assessment. It is incredibly difficult to recover trust and in organisations you know, once it has been exposed to, to challenge efficiencies. Um, and we did report that in the 2018-19 report that Borna Gaelic um, had experienced um, deficiencies in its communication um, with its staff, the extent to which they were engaged. And also, as Pat rightly mentions too, that it wasn't confined as an internal matter. There were you know, concerns of trust in terms of the board's activities and the views of its, its key stakeholders too. So we've seen, I think as Pat kind of touched on a moment or two ago, is that um, the board is assessing the level of its staff engagement through uh, survey activity and is reporting significant improvements. And I think that, you know, and across the piece in, in this report is that we are we really only, we are two years on from um, the last report, um, and we are seeing progress across a range of fronts. And clearly, that's all really welcome. But that, that slight note of caveat that I, I would continue with is that two years isn't an incredibly long period of time, and it matters that the board is functioning well into the medium and longer term. It can sustain the, the momentum that it's built up over the course of the past two years. So while staff survey results engagement um, have increased, it matters that that continues, that it works well, staff feel engaged. Loss of trust that previously reported um, is sustained in terms of the experience that they get as employees of this public body. Um, beyond, the, beyond those remarks, Mr Hoyle, I might just turn again to Pat if there is anything he wishes to add about his own with the staff of the organisation. No, I have nothing much further to add to the Auditor General's comments in that regard. I, I think um, we are now um, – the, probably the context of this is that since um, – my uh, my audit team picked up these issues. We are now almost three years um, um, from that time, and obviously, uh, three years is, um, I think has allowed the organisation the time to make the changes in engagement and communication. There was always very good people within the organisation, good committed individuals. There was in the past there was a, a lack of organisation, a lack of you know clear definition of roles and responsibilities. And I, I think you know all the ingredients were there for the organisation to perform as they should be performing um, three years ago, but the, 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 the systematic changes that the organisation has made has now um, allowed the organ, uh, organisation to perform the way it always should have been performing. Yeah, just on that point, um, Mr. Kenny, it was it was encouraging and, and reassuring to read that performance appraisals have been introduced across the organisation. Do you know what proportion? Um, of the workforce have received uh, those performance appraisals, and have you had any um, uh, opportunity as of yet to assess uh, the effectiveness of that of that process? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the, the 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 process for performance appraisals is is embedded throughout the organisation um, for for all staff members, for all board members. Um, um, it's 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 one that we've not picked it, picked up any issues or concerns as of yet. We'll keep it under review. Um, the, 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 the the big thing that we we've always been pushing um, in terms of these appraisals is a is a is a, a clear linkage to the organisational outcomes and the KPIs, um, particularly for board members. And I think that is something that. Um, the KPIs uh, journey to maximise performance is obviously work in progress, and the organisation recognises that it's still got work to do in delivering the organisation's outcomes and KPIs. And I think the, the performance appraisals have got a clear linkage into achieving that. 
And just a, a, a final question, if I, if I uh, may convene, in terms of uh, recruitment challenges, bullet point one in the report highlights that the board has amended its policy on the recruitment of Gaelic speakers. So uh, after advertising a post twice before reviewing whether the essential uh, skill and element of, of Gaelic is required. But the board now still includes a requirement for any new staff joining the organisation to commit to uh, learning Gaelic if they're not already Gaelic speakers. That sounds to me to be a very reasonable um, approach. Do you know whether or not this has led to any tangible improvements in the board's recruitment process as, as, as of yet? I'm not sure I have that. Yeah, I'll maybe start action and Pat as ever can, can come in. I'm not sure we know that detail, Mr. Hoy, actually, in terms of how many numbers of staff that, that it relates to and how many um, Gaelic learners that the board have recruited uh, to uh, to posts that they weren't able to uh, fill or, or hard to fill posts. Um, Pat can, can maybe supplement that. I think before I invite him in, what I say, I think it's, it's welcome clarity on, on this point um, and that, that it's been able to report publicly how the board engages with um, recruitment. So. Um, for us, I think there was previous conversations that we heard that if some of these posts um, were reserved for Gaelic speakers and a, and a lack of clarity of who was responsible for what, now that we're seeing that there is clear as to how they will recruit, it's most welcome. But, but as ever, Pat may have the detail on how many uh, new employees that this covers. I, I, I don't have the, the detail. I, I can obviously come back to the committee on that. Um, um, but, but I think, as the Auditor General states, I think you know it's welcome clarity where which wasn't there in the past, and um, it's. But again, it's it's early days, and it's something that uh, you know we have to keep under review in terms of the impact that is that 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 will have in, on the organisation going forward. But I, I'm happy to come back on the detail for that one. Thanks, Sam. I'll, I'll hand back to uh, to Richard. Um, thanks, Craig. And I think, um, Pat, it would be useful if we could get um, that information. That would, uh, I think, that would aid us in our uh, consideration of the report. The other thing, before I move on, uh, just on this area, um, I think, um, Auditor General, you mentioned Exhibit One as um, something for us to have a look at in terms of the organisational uh, chart. And um, um, mention has been made of the important. Um, additional uh, resource that's now been um, uh, put into the organization by the appointment of a head of communications and promotions. But when I look at the organizational chart, um, I see a chief executive below, which is a director of Gaelic education, a director of language planning and community developments, a head of finance and corporate services. But I don't see on there a head of communications and promotions. Are they not at the same level? Are they not part of that uh, more senior executive management team. Yeah, that's our understanding, convener. Actually, that um, there is a um, there is a smaller uh, senior management team in the organisation, but supported by um, an enhanced uh, uh, tier below in the organisation to deliver organisational priorities. I think ultimately, it's for the, the, the board themselves to decide on, on how they best structure themselves and where roles and responsibilities in terms of their staff carry out. So, I, it is for you know for the chief executive and accountable officer to determine how best to, to deliver their structure. What we've seen as auditors is that they've made changes to their structure, brought in additional capacity at the um, at the tier below the executive team to deliver their organisational objectives. Um, at, at, in a relatively early stage, it looks like that's working well, as we've seen feedback from external stakeholders of improvement in their views of the board and higher staff satisfaction. So, whilst the, the post that you mentioned is not part of the executive team, it's still clearly undertaking a very significant role in the organisation, and it has input through uh, reporting lines to the senior executive team. So, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that feels like it. The wrong structure, or that there are deficiencies in it, but one for the board themselves to take a view on about you know, where best roles and responsibilities. Okay, thank you. But uh, and it might be worth um, uh, some reflection uh, being given to that post. I want to turn now to um, uh, Sharon Dowie, who's got um, a, a number of questions which uh, stem from 
the previous report and, of course, the current report uh, about uh, roles and responsibilities. So, Sharon. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, so, looking at the 2018-19 Section 22 report, highlighted issues around a lack of clarity over the respect of roles and responsibilities of the leadership team, committees, the Scottish Government's sponsor team and the board, as well as board members being too involved in operational matters. Um, sounds a bit familiar to another report we read. So, what evidence have you seen that the updated framework document has addressed this lack of clarity? Um, so yes, yeah, so, so this was a, a very significant theme in the 2018-19 report. And I think also in the evidence sessions that the uh, predecessor committee took from the board and, and from the Scottish Government uh, sponsor team as well. And really at the heart of, of many of the issues that um, we reported previously about a lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities, um, excessive involvement of non-executives, executive uh, taking uh, decision making, and then also really a, a framework document that did not support um, what the government should be doing as a sponsor team uh, of the board. And we, we commented in, comment in this report a number of steps have now been taken, all of which are equally important. So training for, for board members, for the executive team. Changing committee structure as well. So we've seen a, a policy and resources committee alongside an audit and assurance committee. But evaluation of those arrangements, and that feels really important. And some of those are, are self-assessment evaluations. Others have been supported by external assessors, as well as featuring on the internal audit program. Um, all signs of progress, Ms. Dowie, in terms of how the board themselves are working their internal arrangements. Can we say a word about the Scottish Government and, and the sponsor team as well, and particularly about the framework document? Recall, I think it was, um, was at the beginning of last year, the Scottish Government Director General wrote to the uh, previous committee um, about some of the steps that the government were taking, the advocacy of its sponsorship arrangements for, for Board McGallick. Um, and they highlighted that they also had done some training and evaluation, some peer review assessment take place between other sponsor uh, teams in government and how sponsorship was working with Board McGallick. Again, welcome signs of that they are treating the matter seriously and responding appropriately. And all of those factors have translated now into a revised framework document. Um, the signs are that that is working well. We are seeing less visible presence of sponsorship teams at board meetings, whilst they have access to papers, minutes, appropriate conversations with the, the chair of the board and, and the chief executive, all signs that um, these steps that were highlighted as really needing done in the previous report have been taken forward. So we're, our conclusion today is that uh, it gives the board the right foundation to move forward with effective governance and sponsorship arrangements. As mentioned previously, and I'll do likewise, we'll continue to monitor this report on progress. But as Saying that Borna Gaelic's governance arrangements, its relationship with the Scottish Government, is back where it really ought to have been um, before the audit reports in 2018-19. Thanks. Can I just ask, Colin Beatty had uh, mentioned earlier about when the recruitment was for the new board. Um, he'd also mentioned that five of the board members were on the board at the, the last audit. Can I ask how long they have actually been in position? Or, or do you, are you aware of how long they have been in position prior to the audit in 2018-19? Um, yeah, it is publicly available information. Unfortunately, I do not have it at um, my uh, fingertips at the moment, but I am sure it will be set out in um, the board's annual report and accounts are available on its website. Usually, it states when individual board members were appointed, what the term of their appointment uh, is and, and clearly associated when that date will end. Um, we will come back to the committee in, in writing after the meeting just to um, confirm exactly uh, which members are appointed on which dates and when they will be up for reappointment. Right, okay. I think my further question in that would have been, depending on when they were appointed, um, why these issues maybe had not been raised earlier in a previous audit, because there was quite a lot of issues in there. So. It was why that maybe hadn't erased its head. I was just wondering if maybe the board was there was quite a lot of new members on it, and that's why it hadn't been highlighted before. 
I think been, in terms, our audit work, in terms, and part of what I comment on this, I'm sure, is that um, we report on, on events that come to our attention during the course of, of the audit, and in the 2018-19 audit, significant events you know, were, were clear and, and, and in that year. Uh, Pat uh, and his audit approach was extended to um, report publicly on, on many of, of these issues. Um, Born and Gallic is a small organisation. Um, it's um, and albeit a, a very important one um, with the, the, the role that, that it has. Um, typically, a audit approach for small organisations is to look at the, the financial statements and aspects of its governance. But Pat, through discussion with Audit Scotland, we took a view that we needed a, a much wider, enhanced audit approach during 1819, light of the issues that were coming to our attention. Um, matters do change, Ms. Dow, is what I would say. So, an organisation can have very stable governance operating effectively without a change in, in board members or executive team, but events do happen that, that can lead to change. So, whilst a change in, in board members can be a catalyst, it, it needn't always be the case. As ever, as, as we've touched on, we'll continue to report. But I wonder, maybe, if it, just to invite Pat, just to say a, um, a word or two about you know, his own experience again, if it'd be helpful from 1819 and how that moves into to this year's audit report. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Auditor General. Yeah, I mean, in, in 1819, <coughs> excuse me, we, we, we just uh, we, we had some concerns in, in previous years, uh, and they were reported in our uh, annual audit report. But when it when it got to 1819, our risk assessment um, procedures really raised significant red flags. That uh, seems to be the the word of the morning, and um, that was why we. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, we undertook a much more in-depth audit in that particular year. Um, I, I, I don't think there was any direct correlation with the, the tenure of the board members or, or uh, length of service or their, how long they've been in the organisation. I think there were other factors at play, um, um, which was fundamentally back to you know that lack of uh, clarity in roles and responsibilities. Um, I think that was the key driving force, and that, as I say, caused us to do a much more extensive audit in 1819. Thank you. Um, and just going back on again to sponsor division. So we know that while the Scottish Government's sponsor division is not required to attend board meetings, it receives an invitation. In fact, going by the, the stuff that I read in the report, it would seem that it receives an invitation, and although it gets the minutes from the meetings, it doesn't seem to read them. I would, I would think, but based on the serious issues identified two years ago, do you think that there is merit on the sponsor division attending, if not all, at least some of the meetings, to demonstrate its commitment to supporting the board and to maintain the pace of change? It's a balance in my judgment whether the, the sponsor team uh, should be visible um, at board meetings or otherwise, and I think it's a a judgment that should be reached in discussion between public body and the sponsor team, because I think as we've seen in, in other cases, um, there can be too much involvement of a sponsor team or not enough, um, and that feels like a iterative decision that it's in the right place, depending on the scale of the issues in the public body. Um, and I think it's, I'd probably um, say that it's one that should be kept under regular review. You know, you can gauge from minutes and board papers an organisation's process, its challenges, only up to an extent. So attendance at board meetings would bring benefits, but but for the sponsored team to be permanent fixture at a board meeting, I think can bring a, bring a blurring of responsibilities. Um, if it's that seen that the accountable officer, the chair of the board, um, aren't in uh, and able to discharge their own responsibilities without being under the watch of, of the sponsor team. So I think it's a little bit of horses for courses and, and need to be iterative to support the development of the organisation. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Convener. Thank you very much, Sharon. And I know that uh, Willie Coffey has got to uh, further questions that, uh, that, that further explore some of these areas in the, the context of openness and transparency. So, Willie, over to you. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, Matinva Huladunya. Uh, good morning to everyone. 
Uh, I think the first thing I'd like to say is well done to the board. Um, I remember convener the previous session we had at the audit committee with Board Nagalik, and it was a really difficult session for members of the board at that time. So I think it's really important to recognise the progress that's been made, that's been reflected in the Auditor General's report. So well done to the Karaka, the Chair, and the Kinar, the Chief Exec, and the progress that has been made. Um, I'd like to just ask a couple of questions, if I may, on the theme about open, openness and transparency, Auditor General. And, and you'll recall it's only a couple of years ago that these basic principles were, were just not being met at all. We're, we're still wondering why the sponsor division itself didn't pick up on those issues. But can you say if the sponsor division has played an active role in addressing those issues and, and made some kind of contribution to achieving the progress that they have seen? Morning, Mr. Coffey. I think, um, if I may say first, I think we also welcome the progress and welcome the progress specifically on uh, the openness. I don't say. Um, I'll ask Graham Greenhill just to say a bit more about um, the sponsor team's role and extent to which that has influenced some of the openness and transparency steps that, that we've seen. We're reporting this morning that there has been a step change in the openness and transparency of this public body, that previously that wasn't the feedback that it got from its key stakeholders. And whether it's a um, combination of all of us, the way we, we are operating of the pandemic, more visible use of technology through the streaming of public meetings, as we're doing uh, this morning, um, or whether it's kind of more a uh, conscious response to um, the previous audit reports. Um, Graham and, and Pat may want to express a view. What we have seen, though, is that both committee meetings and board meetings themselves are publicly available meetings, and for um, and for that change, that we are uh, welcoming and commending the board's progress. Um, having gone from an organisation that wasn't open and transparent in how it conducted affairs, it's now moved up to one of being one of the most open and transparent uh, public bodies in Scotland with how it discharges its responsibilities. So, real signs of progress. I'll, I'll pause and invite Graham uh, to share any insights he has and, and the influence that the government has brought to bear on that. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I, as, as Stephen um, said earlier, um, I, I think it's important that. The, uh, the sponsorship division acts in a proportionate and risk-based way, and um, clearly their involvement in uh, reviewing, along with um, Portugal, the, uh, the, the framework document, has been a key step in allowing it to reconsider the way in which it contributes to the activities of um, the board. And um, on the whole, I, th I think you know I think we can see that. Um, the, uh, they, they have had a role. They have truly engaged with the, the board subsequent to uh, this committee's previous uh, examination of the, uh, the 2018-19 section 20. So, uh, so yeah, on the, on the whole, I think I think we can see that the board, uh, that the sponsor division, has played a full part in supporting the board as it takes its improvement agenda forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, in the last session, you might remember also, Auditor General, that the Director General for Education said there might be greater scope for the government to, to engage more directly with the Gaelic community, I think, to, to gauge their views of the board, what, how, how their relationship was. Did that happen, or has, it been, has that really been picked up naturally as a result of the work and the action plan that the board has recently been working through? I'm not sure I know the, the specifics of the government's interaction um, over and above the, the board's own activity, Mr. Coffey. Again, I'll invite Graham and Pat if there's anything they can add on that uh, and where that sat on the action plan. The, the point I, would, I guess I would, I would make about the, um, the work of the board in terms of engaging with the stakeholders has been a key part of, of the progress uh, that we've seen. Pat mentioned earlier this morning that um, some of the feedback and the survey results that the board have had in terms of its interaction with its key stakeholders has changed um, for the uh, for the better over the course of the past now two and a half three years. 
Um, and that's really welcome because you're right. That was a key theme of the the last evidence sessions was that a disconnect or a, a breakdown in relationship with key stakeholders. So again, you know, another clear sign of of progress that um, there is confidence, there is improving trust between the board uh, and its key stakeholders. And I guess that re that really matters well because you know, just looking at this organisation, um, it spends around you know five and a half, six million pounds per year. Um, with just over a million pounds of that on staff costs, it was predominantly a grant giving, a public, a supporting organisation on behalf of of other organisations discharging activities to support the Gaelic language. So that the relationships that it has with these organisations is essential for it to discharge its purpose. And um, so signs of progress. But um, again, I'll just turn to uh, Graham and Pat if anything they can add about what specifics the government have done themselves on this. I, I I don't think I can give specific examples. Um, Pat, is there anything you might be able to add? Not <clears throat> not in the, the specific um, um, of, of of the government uh, the government or the sponsor role. Only to give the, the committee the the assurance that we've picked up again big improvements in terms of how the the organisation engages with ex with external stakeholders. For example, monthly meetings are held with the major Gaelic organisations like NG Alba. Um, there's been very good consultation uh, um, on how Gaelic um, uh, impacts in, uh, in, in um, early years and in terms of um, the young people of Scotland. Um, so, uh, and again, as I said earlier, the, the, the social media has improved dramatically. The organisation also did a stakeholder survey. An external stakeholder survey during the year, and the results of that were positive. So, um, not with, notwithstanding the, the specifics um, in terms of the sponsor division, certainly the organisation as a whole has really driven that uh, agenda forward in terms of how it consults with its stakeholders, and that, that, that there's certainly been a, a significant improvement in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really positive here. I mean, my questions are, are they're kind of about how uh, we've engaged with the wider Gaelic community. It's, it's, they're a key part to any of the progress that can be made. I think everybody recognises that, and there's been great progress. It sounds very much like it. In, in terms of the, the improvement plan and the, the recent continuous improvement plan, is there a direct reach out to the Gaelic stakeholders, Gaelic community on that, or, or, or was it a process that the board engaged with? themselves to deliver. I mean, I think it's probably important that they reach out and engage with the wider community to get their agreement and to, to work alongside them with that. So, was there evidence that that took place? Would you say? I'm happy to start. Actually, I'll ask Pat to come in uh, in a moment too. I think um, that we've seen. I think it's mentioned. You know, 71 out of 72 recommendations uh, progressing, and you know, real evidence of engagement with. Uh, Gaelic-speaking organisations, the recipients of funding from the board, and you know, and, and regular, um, meaningful engagement, are clearly signs of progress. How that's translated into um, the views of um, perhaps people who aren't represented or members of organisations also matters. You know, just the, the views of the community itself. And um, the, the one note, not, not perhaps caution, Mr. Coffey, but I think what we have seen as we. Just as, we, as an appendix to the report about the, the KPIs um, of the board um, this year, is that not all of those have, have, were met during the 2020-2021, and clearly the pandemic has has played a part in that. So it will have changed the way that the board might wish to have engaged directly with some of the, the Gaelic-speaking community, um, and just the way that we some of the restrictions that will have impeded its ability to to do some of that work. Um, as and when they're able to, or perhaps using you know, alternative engagement mechanisms, it will be for the board to decide how they look to uh, get feedback, expand their reach, make sure that the grants, the funding that they're giving, is having the, the, the most significant impact. Um, again, I'm going to I'll pause there for a moment just to see if, if Pat can supplement beyond the interaction with MG Alaba and other grant uh, receiving organisations, uh, whether they've been able to speak directly uh, to, to the Galaxy. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, going back to the, you know, uh, your initial question, Mr. Coffey, I think that the it was a dual process within the improvement plan. The improvement plan and the initial audit identified a, a, an issue with a consultation with external stakeholders uh, that, that the organ, organisation had to improve, and the organisation accepted that and took that on board and really tried to significantly improve its approach. So I, I think the initial improvement plan was a driver for that, but. You know, all credit to the organisation uh, for rolling its sleeves up and actually working very hard to make big changes in how it engaged with external stakeholders. And, and we have now no concerns. Uh, we, we, we think they're doing what they should be doing. But to be fair, what they should have been doing all along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And probably just lastly, from me, convener to, to Stephen, do you, do you think, as, as a result of uh, the, the good work that's been done, uh, do you think the board has now regained the confidence of its stakeholders, Stephen? Certainly, the feedback that you know, the board has received from uh, both the uh, staff and also from the uh, organisations that its key stakeholders that it interacts with that it's. Uh, approval ratings um, are far better than they were. Um, it's never a given, Mr. Coffey. You know, I think that, that the board has to continue to work hard, both internally with its colleagues uh, and also with uh, the organisations, its funding organisations, to ensure that it's doing all that it ought to, it's meeting their expectations. So whilst they've recovered, um, as, Pat, as Pat suggested, perhaps to where they ought to have been. Um, you can never take that for granted. They have to continue to work hard, engage, and ensure that they deliver uh, upon their performance indicators and what they are there to do to support the Gaelic community, uh, Gaelic speaking community. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a good answer and uh, wise words as usual from the Auditor General. I think a, a big well done. I think to the board convener and um, back to you. Thanks, Willie. Um, uh, thanks very much indeed. And. Uh, before we um, finish up this evidence session, uh, there was just one other area I wanted to touch on just very briefly. And uh, one of the recurring themes of this committee and its predecessor committees has been a, a regular acquaintance with organizations uh, that are not meeting the standards we would expect because of a failure to uh, plan uh, the workforce requirements of the present and the future. And uh, again, I uh, recall that in the 2018-19 report, uh, uh, insufficient workforce planning uh, and uh, quite an excess of vacancies, I think, was an issue, uh, which was uh, which was seen to be part of the uh, some of the fundamental problems that the organisation faced. So I just really wanted to check in, uh, beginning with you, I think, um, uh, Stephen, on where things now are with workforce planning. Have there been uh, improvements, uh, and are there any other uh, kind of workforce priorities that the board needs to consider, in your opinion? Thanks, Convener. So yes, there have been improvements. Um, they now have a workforce plan that's connected to a corporate plan, um, and similarly, as, as spoken about earlier this morning, that um, the organisation will evolve from the improvement plan response to the previous audits into a more a, a continuous form of improvement. And workforce is a component of that alongside a dedicated um, workforce plan. We've also talked about a revised approach to some of the hard to fill vacancies um, in the organisation and plans for uh, broadening those out to uh, Gaelic learners as opposed to um, fluent uh, Gaelic speakers. Um, with any organisation, they have to keep their workforce plan under continuous review that they can, uh, responding to events, planning for the future, that is connected to how they will deliver services now and in the future. And as we know, Portugal is not a big organisation, and being, a, being in, in, in such circumstances, um, there is an inevitability that they will have key person dependencies, um, just with the, the nature of how they will deliver services. Um, Succession planning is a key component of that, that you know, where they are able to, they can look to the future, look at the age profile, the career ambi ambitions um, of their people, and marry up all of these factors so that the workforce plan is supporting the, the development and delivery. Uh, but in short, it can be in a real sense of progress, so that they have a workforce plan 
and that that's a, a central part of their, their future decision making. Thank you. Well, on that positive note, I think that uh, that concludes the questions that uh, the committee has got. And uh, can I thank, as always, the Auditor General, uh, Graham uh, and Pat, for joining us this morning uh, to give uh, your uh, evidence and your insights into uh, the progress that's been made with uh, Bordner Gallic. So uh, I will now draw this uh, session uh, to a close and I will suspend the meeting briefly. Thank you.
Well, can I uh, welcome people back to the um, uh, first meeting of the uh, Public Audit Committee in 2022. And uh, for this uh, part of our deliberations, uh, we are receiving evidence uh, on an Audit Scotland report recently completed into NHS Ireland. And um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome, uh, to give evidence in this session, uh, the Auditor General, Stephen Boyle. Uh, welcome back, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, in this session, is being joined by Lee Johnson, who is a Senior Manager, Performance Audit and Best Value at Audit Scotland. Uh, and uh, I'm also pleased to um, uh, extend a welcome uh, to Joanne Brown, who is a partner in Grant Thornton, who has been involved in uh, working on this audit. Uh, but can I begin, uh, Auditor General, by uh, inviting you to make a short opening statement? Thank you. Many thanks, Convener. I've prepared this report on the 2020-21 audit of NHS Highland under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Scotland Act 2000. This is the fifth report on issues of financial sustainability in NHS Highland in the past eight years. Previous reports have highlighted issues terms covering finance, performance and governance. Today's report sets out the progress that NHS Highland has made in these areas over the past two years. The external auditor has given an unmodified opinion and highlighted that their board operated within its financial resource targets. It has done so while responding to the operational and financial challenges of COVID-19 on its service delivery. NHS Highland's financial position has been challenging in recent it has required additional financial support from the Scottish Government in each of the last three financial years in order to achieve financial balance. Nonetheless, NHS Highland is making progress. There are more stable leadership team and financial management arrangements are strengthened, alongside improvements in governance and aspects of service delivery. Health services in NHS Highland are more expensive than in other parts of Scotland, and the Board has needed to develop a more sustainable approach. It has made some progress in reducing its reliance upon locum. And the established programme management office set up in 2018-19 to oversee service transformation recovery plans has also played an important part in the board's financial recovery. Ongoing progress, though, will be needed to ensure sustainability and performance improvement. So, the steps have also been taken to improve NHS Highlands culture following the 2019 Thurrock Review. Two key actions were progressed, being the completion of a culture survey in the Anglia and Butte area of NHS Highlands activity, and also the development and approval of a healing process for current and former employees. As with all NHS boards, the pandemic has played a significant impact on the focus and priorities of NHS Highland. Its effect on the board's longer-term financial position Things targets remains uncertain. Achieving a balanced financial position depends on the successful delivery of a cost improvement plan, and the board has acknowledged that the plan developed 21-22 challenging. Many of these challenges will be shared by health boards across Scotland. And Vener, as ever, Joanne, Dee, and myself will do our best to answer all the committee's questions this morning. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Stephen, for that um, opening statement. And uh, as you will understand, we've got uh, quite a number of questions uh, on everything from the implications of the Sturrock report and the progress that's been made uh, in addressing the issues identified in it through to uh, the funding formula and uh, the recurring challenges which, um, which are faced by uh, a health board which is operating in the most uh, rural uh, part of Scotland in delivering services uh, which uh, need to be, uh, as far as possible, uh, accessible to the population it serves. Um, but I want to start um, uh, just by uh, turning to paragraph 14 of the report on page 5, uh, where um, we are um, reminded that um, NHS Highland has moved down in the, um, in the escalation framework from level 4 down to level 3. Uh, and um, uh, that, um, certainly on face value, appears to be a very positive uh, development. So I wonder whether you could give us um, a summary of, of the improvements that have been made, as you understand it, that have seen uh, the de-escalation uh, of the health boards 
status and perhaps in so doing could you uh, give any assessment that you've got as to whether you think uh, it's moving in the direction of uh, level three down to level two uh, or are there still uh, bigger challenges to be uh, to be overcome uh, Stephen, I'll ask you to uh, open up on the evidence on that. Many thanks, Kavira. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring colleagues in and, and, and to, to, to kind of share their perspective. Um, I, I agree with your assessment. I think it is a positive step that um, NHS Highlands has dropped down from level four to level three in terms of its escalation status. Um, the basis for that also looks reasonable in terms of the, the judgment that government has made. And bearing in mind some of the progress that we're also reporting in today's report, and so we've seen progress, as we mentioned in the paragraph, in terms of um, its financial management, uh, sustainability, some of the governance aspects uh, of the organisation, um, similarly in, in leadership and, and culture, and, and aspects of its mental health services do so. Um, there is not just one factor convener that has. Um, uh, help the government reach the decision on the escalation status of, of NHS Highland. The level four to level three would be consistent with some of the progress that we're reporting today. How that then translates into whether there'll be uh, a, an even lower escalation status will be a matter for NHS Highland, the progress that it makes and any judgment that the government uh, arrives at. I think what, what we are seeing in, in today's report is that Whilst progress has been made across a number of fronts, there are still very many challenges uh, for the, uh, the board to address around its finance, service delivery, um, and service delivery, as you say in your, your opening remarks, in a, in a remote and rural setting that brings challenges with its cost base, its access uh, to services, all of which will, the board will want to ensure that it is satisfied. And of course, not just that around an escalation status or number, but actually that patients are getting the experience that they expect uh, from their health board in the Highlands. Um, can we, I'll pause. Actually, maybe turn to Lee first of all, who may wish to say a bit more about um, the escalation status and steps that might need to happen to to move to an even lower number. Lee. Thank you. Auditor General, um, I don't really have uh, much to add to what um, the Auditor General has already said. Um, it will be um, a decision for government to make uh, in terms of whether um, they move uh, down. As, as the Auditor General said, we have seen improvements, so we think that the move from four to three is a fair reflection. Um, but it, as uh, as the Auditor General also indicated, they still have some challenges, um, and it will be. Um, in terms of the board working to address those challenges, and then it will be up to Scottish Government to make a decision about any further um, de-escalation of the board. Okay, okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, I want to move on now to uh, to look in a bit more depth at um, uh, financial management uh, of the board, and uh, I want to um, invite Craig Hoy to um, uh, to uh, pose a number of questions. To into that area, Craig. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, just turning, to, as the convener said, to financial management and financial uh, stewardship. The report in paragraph 15, page five, comments on NHS Highland delivering a break-even position while operating in a period of considerable uncertainty, and while responding to the uh, operational and financial challenges obviously posed by the COVID-19 pandemic on service delivery. Given those circumstances and, and, and given the, the, the backdrop, um, Mr. Ball, how much of an achievement do you consider this to be on the part of NHS Highland? Good morning again, Mr. Hoy. I think um, it is a, it's important that all health boards um, meet their financial targets. So the requirements for, for boards are to break even against their revenue resource limit, their capital resource limit, and within the confines of any uh, cash. Is a requirement that they, they agree with the Scottish Government. So uh, it is welcome that NHS Highland have managed to break even and reporting a, a small surplus of uh, £700,000 uh, for the year. Um, Joanne Brown might want to come in in a moment or two just to say a bit more about the nature of, of that break even. But um, as we go on to report in, in the report that 2020 um, 2021 was an incredibly unusual year for all that we've through over the course of the pandemic. And that's obviously then translated into the finances 
of health boards, NHS Highland, um, and really all health boards across Scotland. So NHS Highland has received significant additional funding, as we would expect, to, to cope with the challenges um, of the pandemic. So paragraph 17 that they received £57.3 million from the government to cope with some of those challenges. Um, on top of that, um, NHS Highland also received a further £8.8 .8 million for its financial position. Here. In previous years, uh, the committee will, will have seen that NHS Highland has been a recipient of brokerage funding or end-year loan funding um, from the government. Um, so this is not brokerage that the board received, but it was additional funding to support its position. Um, as ever, Mr Hoy, I think the, the context for 2021, though, was clearly all about the pandemic and its impact upon services. That has played through very directly into its financial position, but positive nonetheless that it has a, the NHS has broken even. In. Again, I'll maybe just invite Joanne Brown if she wishes anything she wants to. Add. Thanks, Stephen. The the only thing I would add to Stephen's outline there is around the success of the PMO. So what we did see in 2021 was the PMO continuing to operate in what was quite a difficult environment due to COVID and anticipating the delivery of the savings. So whilst they started the year with a financial savings of £37 million, and they still required the additional funding, as Stephen set out, of the £8 million to help support break-even, the PMO itself delivered on a number of savings, and increasingly we started to see more of those savings being recurring of nature. So I would pinpoint particularly the PMO as being a key success factor for 2021 in terms of financial planning and then achievement of the financial position. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. 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 Boyle. You've almost read my mind in respect of the, of the next question, but just perhaps just seek confirmation from you. You referred to the fact that the Scottish Government provided an additional funding of 8.8 .8 million, which was that that would have been anticipated through uh, brokerage. Um, can you? Confirm and tell us why the Scottish Government provided that 8.8 .8 million as additional funding, and and not as brokerage. So um, I think we'll be able to give a perspective on that, but it might be that there will only be that, Mr. Hoy, actually, and maybe that the committee want to inquire directly with Government or NHS Highland as to the subtle difference. I think that we are seeing here between um, additional financial support as distinct from what we would have previously known as brokerage funding. The history has changed around with brokerage funding and the previously financial support that the government gave to health boards uh, for brokerage had to be repaid in subsequent years. Uh, that arrangement ended three years ago now, if, if memory serves me correct, that previous brokerage um, no longer had to be repaid. And that, that was significant for NHS Highland because you know many millions of pounds was, was due to Aid. Um, but the government's decision, and I'm, and I'm sure, but I would only be speculating, so caveat slightly, is that the context of COVID has changed how health boards have worked. And I think, as, as Joanne mentions, although they've made progress with savings, their ability to operate in a normal environment was severely constrained, and that would have impacted the extent to which they would have made savings in a normal way before the pandemic. Some of that will have flowed through to the financial position, and the government has arrived at the decision not to give brokerage, but instead to give uh, year end financial support. Right. Obviously, just on, on the issue of, of savings, the, the report explains that the board delivered a total efficiency savings of £20.7 million in 2021, of which £5.4 million, which is 26 per cent, were recurring. Does that mean that 74 per cent, nearly three quarters of the total savings, uh, can be counted as, as non recurring? Yes, it does. So, and if I may say that uh, that historically has been uh, an ongoing challenge, and, yeah. and you know, Joanne's quite right, is that one of the key um, steps that the Programme Management Office on, on, on in, in the round have to make is to, to deliver a secure financial position. It, the, what matters is longer-term service change or transformation, um, and Ending a reliance on non-recurring savings to yeah. secure the, the financial position. That's, of course, challenging the non-recurring, some of which can be opportunistic or 
circumstance led. But you're right, the, the ratio is either one or the other. It's either non-recurring or recurring. Yeah. And could you just perhaps um, flesh out a little, or perhaps Joanne might be able to say how those non-recurring financial savings were made? And do you have any insight at this point in time to how the board plans to take this forward in respect of, of planned savings in, into future financial years? Yeah, I'll, think, I'll ask Joanne to come in in a moment, actually, but I'll maybe just um, say about the detail, both in the 2020-21 financial year and also looking forward to the current financial year and beyond. Um, and as we, I think, as we said at Exhibit 2 to the report, um, there is a, what I think is a welcome change of emphasis um, of the savings of 32.9 million are planned for the 21-22 financial year, with only an identified 4.5 million pounds of those of, of being non-recurring. And so, if the board can deliver on that, and that's and that is no means certain, given the unpredictable environment that we're in, that will be a very significant step forward. Um, but as you suggest, Mr. Oyl, I'll turn to Joanne if anything that she wishes to add. And in terms of the PMO and the bulk of the savings programmes that make up the 25 million, there's um, something like 186 teams that sit within there. And the ultimate aim of the PMO is to focus in on what you can achieve around recurring savings. So there's a number of bigger schemes in there which are actually based on service redesign and change rather than one off gains. For example, improving procurement and um, prescribing sits within that programme, things like theatre productivity. So they are really aiming to get those recurring savings through through the PMO. And within the PMO itself, all savings go through um, effectively a five stage approach and they continue to report and risk assess on those savings. And as part of that risk assessment, they identify the recurring or non recurring nature of those savings. It does continue to be a challenge, as the Auditor General said, they, they typically have struggled on recurring savings, but we have started to see an improvement and a number of service redesigns are planned to support that. Obviously, COVID will have an impact on that, but they are very much focused on turning those to recurring savings. Thank you. Yeah, it strikes me there's a, a very similar position to many local authorities in, in certain respects. Um, that was great. I'll, I'll hand you back to um, the convener. Um, th thank you very much indeed. And we want to um, uh, further um, interrogate uh, the, the financial position of the board, and not just in terms of its management, but in terms of its uh, sustainability. And Colin Beatty has got a whole series of questions to ask uh, about that. Colin. Thank you, convener. Um, Honourable General, your report explains that the NHS's uh, budget uplift of 16.4 million is its share of the 30.2 million being provided nationally to maintain NHS boards within 0.8% of NRAC parity. Now, simple calculation seems to tell me that the NHS receives over half the funding that's available nationally. Is that correct? So, so the, um, partly, I think, is the answer, Mr. BT. So, um, what we are, what we're referring to, I think, is paragraph 20 of, of the report, is the um, the national resource allocation funding model, and this is the the overall model with which the Scottish government, uh, in conjunction with NHS boards, uses to distribute funds to health boards across the country, based on a, a, a range of factors. Uh, I think, as we, we set out, just one of the footnotes to the report, depending on Population size, deprivation levels, uh, geographical factors, and so forth. And in terms of the uplift of 16.4 million pounds, we're referring that as the NHS Highlands share of 32 million pounds uh, to support NHS NHS boards move to within 0.8 percent, part of the government's model of what they call NRAC parity. There's a long history to all of this, Mr. Beatty, in terms of boards. Uh, views on their financial position and, and where they ought to be relative to the funding that they receive. And the overall story suggests is that um, NHS Highland is moving closer to its view of is it getting the share of overall resources required to deliver health services, and of the overall allocation, it received more than 50% of that uplift arrangement during the course of uh, the financial year. So the answer is yes. 
Yeah, and, and, and Paul, in short, yes, they have received more than half of, of that particular component of NHS funding. It seems extraordinary that one health board gets such a, a, a significant uplift. I think it, I'm not, I'm not is, questioning whether they deserve it or not. I'm just saying it seems disproportionate. And it probably reflects, um, as I say, there's, there is much history behind this. The, the use of this funding model to allocate resources to particular health boards, and you know, many reviews over the years, and you might want to say a bit more about some of the history of that. But you know, there was a point that it came to government's approach was to resolve the uh, the views and unease in different uh, health boards across the country about their share, and the model that the, the revised arrangement can be well. We need to move to a point that there is uh, parity. And within 0.8 percent of that parity, because a number of boards, Ireland being one of them, were adrift from the parity. So I think what we're seeing is a catch-up style arrangement uh, being played out, and additional funding being provided by the government to Highland to support that. Um, if if it's helpful, Mr. Beattie, maybe invite Lee just to give a bit more detail on how that's working. Yeah, I'd be interested to know if, uh, in, in your opinion, it uh, reflects a, a fa the fair situation as far as uh, NHS. Highlands. I'll, I'll answer that question, and then I'll, I'll turn to Lee. I think NHS Highlands' view would be that, um, and of course they can speak for themselves, that it has been a factor in terms of its financial challenges in in years gone by, where it sat relative to NRAC parity compared to other boards. The additional funding that it's now received will help move to both not both towards parity, but more importantly, the, its financial sustainability and the services that it can provide uh, to its communities. Uh, again, Mr. B.T. Lee, I'll, um, I'll invite him just to say a bit more about uh, how that's all working. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, I, I don't really have much more to add to what the Auditor General said. I think um, the main point being, um, yes, Highlands have had a significant uplift this year, but it's because um, historically, they've been further from parity compared to other uh, boards, and I think that's what's reflected in that quite significant uplift this year. Okay, I'll move on to another question. Paragraph 21, page 7. Your report tells us that the boards recognise that elements of costs included within the financial plan may potentially become part of core services in the future, but the longer-term funding position doesn't seem very clear. It isn't clear. Can you provide some detail as to why the longer-term funding position is unclear? Yeah, we'll, we'll do our best, and I'm happy to uh, say a, moment, uh, a word or two about that. And I maybe just highlight to the committee that, in addition to today's report, we'll also be publishing our overview of the NHS in Scotland next month. Which looks at a, a, a much wider look at the financial position, service delivery challenges, how the NHS will remobilise its services, so, um, living with COVID, beyond COVID, um, and so forth. And clearly, that's a component of the, the judgment that we reach um, in this report too. That how NHS Highland will deliver services, its service delivery um, options um, will evolve as a result of the pandemic. We have spoken at previous committees about you know, some of the changes that are already happening, um, such as the increasing use of digital technologies in terms of uh, service delivery, and also what its remobilisation plan looks like and how that will be delivered. The Highlands will be one of the sites for one of the new uh, national elective centres for the NHS in Scotland to deliver services. All of that will play through into what feels like an uncertain and, and potentially quite volatile service <coughs> and funding environment. Just, I was just thinking there, actually, looking at this report, there's one significant thing that's missing from it. In all the previous reports about NHS Highland, great mention has been made of, I think it's Regmore Hospital. Which had significant overruns on prescriptions, on staffing, and almost everything you can think about, but it's 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 vanished completely. 
Does that mean everything's good there? That everything's uh, everything's uh, under control? Um, so you're right. We we haven't focused on um, Wigmore Hospital um, in this report. Um, Wanted to say a little bit more about the financial impact of Rigmore on NHS Highlands' uh, overall position, but um, it's not an unconscious choice, Mr. Beattie. I, I should say is that um, whilst Rigmore you know, will be a, a very significant component of the programme management office, the need for savings, service changes in the future, it is it's the largest single hospital in the Highlands where it delivers much of its acute activity. We felt that it wasn't the, the the overall story in the way that it has been in previous years, particularly in, in light of of the pandemic. Forward look uh, for savings, service change, and so forth. And um, so, Redmore will remain part of our focus. So we'll continue to audit and report uh, through our work, um, and as we follow up through both the NHS overview report and future audit reporting. How that all means for uh, Redmore's impact in the year in question. And I'll just pass to Joanne if there's anything she wishes to say. Thanks. The, the only comment I would add to that is what we've seen in terms of Reid Moore is the appointment of a new Deputy Chief Officer, and there has been some changes in the senior clinical team and the leadership team within Reid Moore. So, as the Auditor General outlined, a number of those savings within the PMO do relate to Ragmore, but we have started to see positive change around Ragmore and the achievement of savings, which in the past they have not been able to make. And now that is obviously something we will continue to consider within our external audit work going forward in terms of the long-term position around Ragmore. Thanks. Okay. It would have been interesting to have seen the continuity on the Ragmore side in terms of the, the progress it is making. making. Uh, no doubt that will come up again in the future. Just, just to carry on here, paragraph 23, page 7. Uh, the report tells us that the financial plan requires £32.9 million of savings to be delivered through the cost improvement programme. Where, where are these savings likely to come from? Um, in the past, NHS Highlands had great difficulty in getting uh, recurring savings. So many of them just seem to be one-offs, which uh, patched up. So, where are these savings going to come from? Where are they I'll start. On that. Yeah, I'll have to start. I must have been joined uh, uh, me. I'm sure. Forty-two point million is a significant savings to be made. I think that that informs our overall judgment on on NHS Highland in this report. Is that whilst progress has been made. It needs to continue that progress, deliver on a recurring basis some of the service change and associated savings. Um, we have pointed in the report, and Joanne's rightly mentioned, the role of the Programme Management Office that combines both service change and associated financial savings in a way that allows the Board, we hope, to move on from some of the non recurring emphasis savings that we have reported on in previous years. Actually, some of the savings are, can be embedded um, and built upon from, from one year to the next. Exhibit two to the report, um, we give the three high level categories of, of savings where the 32, uh, £32.9 million pounds will become from. As you will see, most of that is through the Programme Management Office, along with a smaller component of non recurring savings, and then some of the to do with its um, adult social care uh, arrangements uh, with the Highland Council. That Joanne previously mentioned uh, prescribing and other components, but do you may wish to elaborate on some of the uh, the more detail of where the, the recurring savings uh, will be made as part of that thirty two point nine million pounds? Joanne. In terms of what I could add to that, um, there are a number of thematic areas where they are looking at the service redesign to get the recurring savings. I don't have to hand for twenty one twenty two how much of what is within the PMO has been achieved to date and on the basis of what is recurring in nature. But my understanding is that about at least 80 per cent of what they set out to try to save within the PMO, they feel confident they will achieve during 2021-22. There are a number of thematic areas in there around prescribing, procurement, 
there's um, certainly some recurring savings they've been able to make within corporate services and estates and facilities. Um, as we've seen through the COVID pandemic, naturally NHS Highland have had to uh, change how they have delivered services. And one of the key things for them going forward will be digital, uh, digital clinical engagement and the continuation of Near Me, where they have seen a different service model, which is in turn benefiting them in terms of the financial savings they need to make. But there is still risk there around the recurring, non-recurring nature, and that's something that's routinely reported through the Financial Savings Board and through the PLMO itself. Did you find any indications that uh, NHS Highland is using staff vacancies, particularly at consultant level, to manage its savings? In other words, delaying appointments? No. No, and there will be some non-recurring savings that naturally happen due to difficulties in appointing to positions. But within the medical clinical workforce side of things, that's still a, an area of cost pressure for them um, as they deliver their services, and that's not an area they're looking to achieve non-recurring one-off savings. Okay, thank you. Just one last question, paragraph 25, page 8. Uh, the report tells us that NHS Highland is not currently budgeting for a financial brokerage requirement from the Scottish Government. This is for the 2021-22 financial year. Do you think it's possible that NHS Highland will require some level of brokerage from the Scottish Government in the current financial year, given the other things that we're taking into account? So I think it's possible. Sorry, Joanne. Um, let me ask you a second. I, I was just. I, I think it is possible, Mr. Beattie, um, that we may require additional funding or financial support from the Scottish Government, uh, as we say in the report that that was a component of 8.8 .8 .8 million pounds of additional financial support from the government in the uh, 2021 year. And as we've just discussed, there are sig significant challenging savings plans to be delivered, along with the uncertainty about. Uh, how the pandemic will evolve further for the rest of, of this year. Um, so it is possible, um, and it will be you know, a matter for NHSL and the government to can keep the financial position under really close review, so that that doesn't come as any surprise late on towards the end of the, the year end. Uh, but sorry, Joanne, you might want to come in and say um, uh, your own thoughts. Yeah, the, the only thing I was going to say was from a perspective of 21-22, at this point in time, NHS Highlands are forecasting break even, potentially a slightly small surplus, and at the moment that doesn't involve what would be traditionally referred to as brokerage within the NHS. It is acknowledged, though, as the Auditor General set out, there is um, a number of the additional COVID monies um, around the NHS at the moment and sitting with NHS Highlands, which I think will support the achievement of break even, similar to what we have seen in 2021. Mm. So, in effect, uh, the COVID monies are masking, to some extent, the underlying financial issues. Would that be correct? I'm not saying. I, again, Joanne will have a perspective on this, but I, I don't think there's a um, there's a lack of transparency about the the financial position challenges that NHS Highland is looking to address. That it's you know, clear that there is a significant financial Savings plan, you know, with steps how to, to deliver upon, you know, nearly thirty-three million pounds, um, is is part of that. Like all health boards, NHS Ireland has received considerable COVID funding um, from the Scottish government, which is shaping and influencing its position. As and when the pandemic ends, there will be a need to recalibrate what that means in terms of financial position, service delivery. And probably likely is that it won't go back to how it was before the pandemic. Joanne rightly mentions, and, and as we've discussed at the committee previously, that the adoption of different service models, near me being one of them, um, is an essential factor. And as, uh, as Audit Scholar said, and, and my predecessor rightly pointed out, that um, before the pandemic, the NHS in Scotland wasn't in a sustainable financial position. So therefore, all of the the learning. To transform, to deliver both you know, service delivery requirements and financial sustainability are ever more important. 
COVID monies are, are shaping that at the moment. When the pandemic uh, subsides, that will be the, the time to, to restate what that means, both in terms of service delivery and associated funding. Thank you, General. Back to you, Convener. Um, thank you very much indeed. And, and I'm bound to reflect on that evidence that there has been uh, a lot of controversy uh, in the Highlands about the centralisation of services. So when uh, Joanne speaks of uh, service redesign, I guess uh, the question that many people uh, in the Highlands will be asking, uh, to what extent is that clinically led and to what extent is that financially led? And it may not be um, uh, Auditor General for you to necessarily offer a commentary on that, but I guess any uh, reflections that you or Joanne have got would be would be useful to get your inside track on what's really pushing those changes. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, can be and, and, and Joanne, if you had anything that she wishes uh, to add. Um, the service, the nature of service uh, delivery and, and design. Primarily, it should be led upon you know, clinically safe combination of appropriate access services and treatment for patients uh, across the Highlands. How that the best model for delivering that is ultimately a matter for NHS Highland Scottish Government. But important that that's uh, part of you know, proper engagement consultation, effectively done uh, with the community's services. Um, what we're doing as, as auditors is looking to uh, express a view on how well public money is being spent, what's been spent, impact um, that's being achieved from that. Uh, and as we look to, to do in, in today's report, is to set out that there are still some significant financial challenges within NHS Highland that is making progress, but in doing so, that it's able to uh, deliver a financial position. And deliver appropriate, safe healthcare for the people of the Highlands, and that's always a balance. You know, and ultimately, it will be for clinicians to determine the model of healthcare that best exists uh, within the Highlands. And um, probably all I would say in that can be now again, but I'm happy to invite Joanne if she wishes to. Yep. The only thing I would add um, is actually I touched on it earlier around the impact digital services is having on NHS Highland and in particular things like Near Me. Um, NHS Highland would say the, before the pandemic there was roughly 88 Near Me consultations a week. At the moment that is now averaging out 1,000 Near Me consultations over the week. And I think from their perspective, that's opened up a different clinical way of working and reaching patients, particularly in the remote rural locations that NHS Highland have. And what they want to do in their strategy going forward is really take that platform and link that to their planned service redesign. And they are already re-looking again at their strategy and service redesign beyond COVID, taking all the positives that have happened and how they can continue to embrace this way of working compared to how they worked in the past. Great, thank you. That's, that's very useful. I want to now uh, turn to uh, Sharon Dowie, who's got um, uh, a series of questions, um, again, returning to this theme of the cost pressures, uh, which um, are demonstrated in the uh, audit report into NHS Highland. So, Sharon. Good morning again. So, um, Auditor General, your report provides welcome information on the progress that NHS Highland has made in respect of tackling its reliance on locum and agency staff, which has been raised in previous Section 22 reports. Uh, so, we've said that we'll fill 21 hard to fill consultant positions, and the board has also took the management of locums back in house in October 2020 to control spending and rates. Um, is this sufficient, or do you believe that there's still more work to be done in this area? I would share your assessment. I think it is welcome progress, um, yeah. and that they have managed to fill challenging posts, some of its uh, consultant positions within some of its rural general hospitals, um, and this was a really distant theme of, <coughs> excuse me, of, of our reporting um, on NHS Highland. In, in living with hard to fill vacancies, the health boards had to incur really huge costs to sustain services. Uh, 
very significant locum and agency. That it's done so um, on, a, on a permanent basis is, is really welcome. <clears throat> the insourcing of the um, the locum uh, arrangements to the board um, is also another sign of progress. Um, we're also reporting similarly that turnover has dropped during the year two. So, so a, a number of welcome signs, Ms. Dowie, but um, will it be enough? I suspect it's one of these things that NHS Highland, really, in particular the Highlands, but, but true of all boards, keep under constant review as to the working patterns, preferences um, of clinicians. And we've seen, and, and we'll continue to re report in our overview report, is that there is enormous strain and pressure upon for working in the NHS, that the well-being of, of people who, who work in the sector needs to be carefully managed, that um, in delivering a ser an essential service, they are also looked after, they are given the right working conditions, and it remains an, an attractive place to work. These are key long-term challenges built into the workforce plans that NHS Highlands and really all health boards will have to keep under close review. So, do you think it's actually the, the, the processes have been put in place that have encouraged people to take up these positions, or is there maybe a bit of the pandemic in there where people maybe haven't been able to move about because of lockdowns or restrictions, and that's what's kept them in position? I think it's a bit of both, actually. So, you know, the, the pandemic, as we've seen, has um, changed some of people's uh, preferences that they may have made uh, before COVID. You know, so, whether people want to live in rural areas and benefit from a different lifestyle. I would speculate that will have influenced the decisions uh, of some of the uh, the people who have moved into some of these posts that were long-term, hard-to-fill uh, posts. Um, that, they, that they will stay in the post is the most is the more important thing. And again, that links back into, as, I think as we touched in the report, about Highlands have made, have made progress with an attraction, recruitment, and, and retention strategies. That's really key for the board, that it can you know, build on the benefits of, of filling these posts and have a model that um, makes NHS Highland an attractive place for people to work. And I think it, it perhaps speaks back to uh, the convener's point about how they can deliver services in the Highlands, that if they can attract highly skilled people who could really work anywhere in the world, you know, for some of these posts, um, that it allows them to have a model of delivering services that doesn't rely upon centralisation and can access services really in, in all parts of the Highland. Um, so the attraction retention strategy is a key component of really the long-term sustainability um, of of service of health service delivery in the Highlands. So is it maybe a bit too early to work out if there's a base practice in there yeah. to see whether that could be passed on to other health boards that sort have of got the same issues? I think that's a fair conclusion, Ms. Dewey. Yeah, I think the, you know, some of the the benefits that we're seeing in Highlands and filling these posts uh, in recent years um, is great. It's great for NHS Highland, and no doubt there'll be other examples in other parts of the country, uh, the south of Scotland, the borders, as well as um, other parts of. Um, islands in, in, in Scotland. Whether that means this is a new model that you want to roll out across the country, I think, um, albeit you know, two, two years into the pandemic, it's something that perhaps too soon to draw any real conclusions. Nonetheless, I'm quite sure NHS Highland will be sharing its learning uh, with other health boards. Thank you. And then moving on, your report sets out the progress that has been made in relation to recruitment and staffing of the Programme Management Office. Are you content with this progress? And I did note earlier that Joanne had uh, mentioned the success of it in delivering the number of savings. So it does seem to be a success. Yeah, I think it's good news. Sorry. Apologies, I, cut, I, I, cut, I missed the end of your question. I cut across you. So, no, it was me. It was just repeating again. Are you content with the progress? Thank you. Um, so we think it's an important contributor. Um, to NHS Highlands service delivery and financial position. Um, we had we set out in the report that um, they now have permanent staff place benefiting from mentoring and knowledge transfer arrangements from consultants who had set up um, the office. And so absolutely signs of progress, but they've got a big important job to do to deliver the, the financial savings and transformation uh, that NHS Highland requires. If I may, I maybe ask Joanne just to, to offer a, a perspective as well. She'll have 
interacted with the programme management office in a word or two. I think what we've seen is over the journey of the establishment of the PMO to how it's not operating now, it's now become much more embedded in NHS Highlands wider arrangements and across the organisation. And what we've seen is a move away from temporary consultant short term support to those posts in the PMO being filled on a permanent basis with suitable skills and experience within that PMO. And what they have now got in place is a really um, reasonable reporting structure where they regularly report and track those savings using dashboards, etc. So, so they have really embraced the setup of that PMO and it's now fully operational with permanent staff, all NHS Highland employees. And that I think is a good place to continue to take the PMO forward into the future years. Thank you. It certainly seems to have been a success. I'm just reading the, the paper. So it says that the, a substantive PMO director is now in place with short term mentoring support being provided by the previous appointee. So do you have any concerns about the previous appointee leaving and will we continue to monitor progress once they've left? Again, maybe ask, Joanne might be a better place to answer that. Thanks. The, the um, short-term mentoring arrangement NHS Highland put in place was just to support the incoming permanent director. That support is now no longer required, um, and the permanent director is now in charge of that PMO and operating that PMO. It's something we'll continue to look at. Obviously, the PMO plays a key role in the financial sustainability of NHS Highlands going forward, and that, I think, will continue to feature within our external audit. But I've not got any concerns with that previous experience leaving and the change in the now permanent setup. Thank you. Back to you, Convener. Thank you very much indeed, Sharon. And uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask Willie Coffey to, uh, to come in at this point. Willie, over to you. Uh, thanks again, Convener. I've only got a couple of short questions uh, for Stephen on leadership and governance, but I wonder, can I just briefly go back to what Joanne said earlier on the near me, the digital stuff? Joanne, did you say that previously we were they were doing about 88 consultations a week, and now it's about 1,000 a week? That, that's a fantastic uh, transformation, and it's been brought about by COVID, hasn't it? But do you get a sense that that will remain in place? Uh, if and hopefully when we get through the COVID emergency, will that kind of digital mechanism and model be retained? Because it would seem to be a good one and particularly successful for NHS Island. Coffee, were you asking Joanne directly on that? Yes, I. If she could just come back on that, Stephen, that would be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Um, NHS Highland have seen a marked change in terms of near me, and that is very much at the forefront of how they plan to consider technology and going forward, taking account of how well it's worked for them within NHS Highland through the pandemic. I think what NHS Highland have seen is confidence um, in the clinicians on using near me and how that can be used by the clinicians, but also confidence from the patient perspective on how, how well that has worked for them particularly given the remote rural nature and, and the amount of travelling that was having to take place previously um, to go and see the relevant clinician. So that is very much part of their future strategy in terms of taking that taking that forward beyond the pandemic. Good, really good to hear that. Thanks for that. Um, just a couple of questions, Stephen, on kind of broader leadership and government governance. Um, your report is really positive about the improvements and the stability of NHS Highlands leadership, and that's really welcome, as is the comments that you made on succession planning. I think there was a comment in your report that the first round of that was due to be done or completed in December. Has, has that been done, do you know, or is it still in progress? Um, so, uh, Joanne might know, or, or, or Lee might know, whether NHS Highland was able to deliver uh, on the first round of succession planning by, by the end of uh, last month, or it happened after our report. Um, if we have that detail, we'll share it, Mr Coffey. If not, we're happy to come back to, to the committee on writing. Uh, before they say a word to you, I think I just wanted to emphasise that the stability of leadership in NHS Highland I think is one of the key catalysts for the progress that, that it's made as a 
in terms of uh, service delivery, governance, and aspects of, of its financial position feeding into the, the work of, of the program management office. That's all really welcome. Um, the, the, the workforce planning succession regimes are really key for all the things we've spoken about already this morning. Um, that, given the workforce challenges that it's had in terms of some of the hard to fill posts, the nature of you know, um, diverse service delivery across you know, a wide geography is such an important component of how NHS Highland uh, will deliver uh, its services in the future. Um, if we know more about this, I'll just turn to the, the team to see if we, if, whether that deadline was achieved. From my perspective, I have nothing that I can add to that update. I'm happy to update the committee after this meeting in terms of what progress has happened and did the plan uh, happen as planned in December. I don't know that to date. Oh, okay, if you could possibly find that information out for us, that would be appreciated, Joanne. So th thanks for that. Um, Stephen, just a second question from me, of course, on paragraphs 39 to 41 in your report, you, you remind us about the start report itself and its review into allegations of bullying and harassment and so on, and uh, part of the ongoing programme to, to transform the, the board's culture. And you mentioned in your opening remarks about the key actions that were taken, including that survey in Argyll and, and the development of a healing process, I think you described it. Could you just say a wee bit more for us about how that is going and how you might monitor that aspect of the, that issue in your program, your own programme of work going forward? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Coffey. The, um, the start review into allegations of bullying and harassment was a really significant event for NHS Highland, you know, cul culminated after many years of concerns by people who worked in the organisation about experience they had and, and how they were treated. So you, so you mentioned I think, uh, that two of the actions that uh, were due to take place were done so, so that there was a similar, similar review of the experience of people who work in the area, or area of NHS Island uh, through a survey, and that their feedback was really consistent with the experiences of NHS workers in the island area of NHS Island. Um, and the second part of it was a a healing process, so the opportunity for people who work in the Highlands to share their perspective, to uh, receive feedback, and to have their voices heard, uh, a very important part of John Sturrock's recommendations for the board uh, to take forward. And then, how that translates in, into the future, the, the, the registration date for the healing process has now passed. We report that there were over 300 um, people sought to register uh, to be part of that process, with an independent panel review. Um, 136 people at the end of May last year have been recommended for a remuneration payment as a result of the experiences they had, and to date, 118 financial payments have been made. At a total of £1.7 million. Pounds. Highland have um, provided for uh, the, the, the remainder of uh, future payments as part of the process, but a very, um, very difficult process, difficult part of NHS Highland's history, Mr. Coffey, but important that they have gone through it and, as ever, the, the, the learning, the experience, the sharing of that. Changes the culture for the better. For the people who work in this island, both in the Highland and their island, part of the health board, um, ex experience what really we'd all expect to experience at our work: that they're treated fairly, with kindness, respect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. I think the convener may want to continue to develop the questions in that area. So, if that's the case, convener, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Willie. Um, yeah, and um, you're absolutely right, um, Auditor General, to talk about the uh, the human dignity and respect that's at the centre uh, of the Sturrock report and recommendations. Um, but um, if I could just turn and finish uh, by looking at uh, the overall uh, cost of it and some of the uh, the nuts and bolts of it, 
I mean, I mean, first of all, do you have any indication of um, how many further recommendations for financial payments uh, there are likely to be? Um, could you clarify who is putting the bill for that? Is it coming from the health board itself, or is there any additional uh, uh, Scottish Government funding uh, being made available? And I don't know whether you or Joanne or, or, or Lee could shed any light on what the um, um, division is between uh, the value of the compensation payments that have been made and the cost of the process itself and the administration of it. So I wonder, Stephen, whether you could begin by yeah. um, addressing those points. Uh, thanks very much, Kabir. I'm happy to, to, to start on that, and I'm sure Joanne will, will want to come in as well. Um, so just really continuing the discussion, Mr. Coffey, um, £1.7 million pounds of payment recommendations have been made across 118 uh, people. Um, all of the costs of both uh, of running the process are being met by the Scottish Government. And this, in addition to the 1.7 million pounds, the cost of uh, setting up, running, administering um, the healing process, other than the healing payments, have been in, are, are 1.1 million pounds. So both the two components, I think, as you suggest, one is the um, the cost of the administering the process, and the other is the payments to individual uh, members of staff. Um, so, not an insignificant amount of public spending. I'm sure you'd agree, uh, convener, that but one that I think is necessary for NHS Highland to have gone through, and that people's experiences, particularly where those were negative and detrimental, uh, is reflected in um, compensation. And that they are, allowed, are able to move on both as individuals and as an organisation with the right learning and, and changes to the culture that they'll want to make on the back of John Sturrock's uh, report. Um, if I've missed anything, I'll just maybe turn to Joanne if there's anything that, that she wishes uh, to add to your question. The only thing I would add is NHS Highland are expecting those final cases to be heard um, by the end of March this financial year, and therefore any remaining financial cost will be shown in the 21-22 accounts. They are tracking, as Stephen said, around the set-up costs and the costs of running the healing process alongside the actual financial payments made. There is a commitment and a plan in place for NHS Highland to take a board paper in July this year, wrapping up effectively the healing process. And as part of that paper, I expect them to obviously consider how well that process has been applied, has it achieved the aims and objectives it was intending to, but also as part of that, considering the value for money aspect around the setup and the payments. So that's something that will be very visible through the board in July is the timetable that NHS Highland are working to for that. Thank you very much. Indeed, that's very useful because I think there is public interest, continuing, continuing public interest in the in the costs of the uh, operation and administration of the healing process and the balance between that and the payouts themselves. The one final, uh, very quick um, point I wanted to ask about was uh, the report um, st uh, uh, states that further work is required to review and redefine some of the risks and the escalation process within the board risk assurance framework. Uh, I wonder whether you could um, uh, just tell us a little bit more about what further work is required on that. Um, I don't know whether that's for Joanne or for Stephen. I may say a word of, introdu of introduction, can be around. Joanne can, uh, can say uh, anything additional that she, that she wishes. Um, we report signs of progress on, on NHS Highlands uh, governance arrangements, both in terms of how it's running, its risk management arrangements, the effectiveness of its audit committee, which are all you know, a key part of the driver for internal control environment. So really important that that has happened, and especially given some of the judgments that were made previously by Joanne and, and Audit Scotland about how effective governance and risk management was uh, in the board. How that translates into the, the board risk assurance framework and the ownership of risks as we're reporting by uh, executive team, um, is really important. It matters that there's visibility and ownership of particular risks and that risk management developed, um, given the, the very significant responsibility and challenges that all health boards in, in have in Scotland. Um, Joanne might want to say a bit more about kind of the, 
the components and the workings of the, the risk assurance framework in the report. John. A lot of work has taken place, um, as outlined in this report, around the risk management framework. Um, it was acknowledged by NHS Highland that they needed to really consolidate on the strategic risks that were facing the organisation and ensure there was clarity around how risks were reported. We have certainly seen a big impact through the risk management steering group, which reviewed its membership and reviewed its role within the governance structure and the link in terms of risk to the various subcommittees and then the board. What they, they still need to do in terms of that is how that is then embedded. So We are comfortable we can see that they have put the right design of the controls and governance in place, but as part of our 21-22 audit, we will be looking at how that is now being really embedded within the governance structure. And One of the areas they continue to look at to further develop not dissimilar to other NHS boards, is around risk appetite and the link to risk appetite and how they mitigate and manage their risks. But we have really seen a, a positive improvement around risk management, and that is something we will now look to make sure that is fully embedded as they take risk forward. Thank you very much indeed. Look, I am um, extremely sorry, but we, are, we have run out of time uh, for this evidence session. And if, um, um, I'm sure there may be uh, there's quite a lot of work to follow up, not least in the points that uh, Joanne you were just addressing there. So, could I take this opportunity to uh, once again uh, thank uh, you, Joanne, for your time and your evidence this morning, which has been uh, very illuminating, uh, and also thank Lee uh, for your input. And as always, uh, can I thank uh, Stephen Boyle, Auditor General, uh, for your uh, work on this? And I'm quite sure there are many themes here that we will return to not least in light of the overall NHS Scotland uh, audit report, which you will be producing next month. Though, uh, Can I bring this um, uh, public session of the committee uh, to a close? Thank you.